How can I hate a person that I don't even know? How? How can I hate a person that I don't know? How can I judge you? I can't. You ever dreamed you would be this close to a prison and not be in it? I didn't, but I can almost hear the thoughts of the men that have spent time there. The pain, mentally, or sometimes physically. Prisons are not a nice place to be for anybody. It's rough. I could tell you a heap of shit. I'm talking about a heap of shit. I didn't even thought about a year. But how long do you think I lived where I really told you the truth? If I told you everything I knew that doesn't have me in these penitentiaries since I've been in here, they'd shoot my head right back over to the penitentiary. That's the facts of life. But I could tell you some hell of a shit. It's kind of weird how your life takes twists and turns that you can't see. I had a good head on my shoulder and I had a real good future ahead of me. And I totally just destroyed everything just by, you know, the decision to do, do that first robbery. To them, we're all rapists, we're all child molesters. I would say 98% say this is parasites. They don't, get, they don't care if we live or die. Uh, they prefer we die. I've been a lot of things in my life, but they'll never be calling me a coward wanting to escape the realities of what I've done with my life and how I've hurt others and their lives and uh, the damage that I've done to others. It's just, it's, it can't be undone. And it's, Yeah, here we go. I've been walking on the way all the way one day. <laughs> right behind this building, there was a bunch of cuddly vines growing underneath a lean-to. And you got a scenic view of the little valley out here, too. I wish I was full of moonshine and lemon juice. Man, that would be good. Y'all, this is 100% pure George Moonshine. Best you ever look in life. And it's childproof. I'm living proof that it's childproof, because I can get a lid off it. And sir, would you take my lid off of this damn jar? Boy, I bust my ass. <laughs> <laughs> they say when you reach 70, you start getting that sometime disease, you know. Sometimes you do things right and sometimes you don't. But, uh, all these drawings here, I don't really consider them magnificent, but I enjoyed drawing them. Helped me pass the time while I was in prison. I tried to do a self-portrait. <laughs> I, I just, man, hey, I screwed up real good on that one. I just, it don't even look nothing like me. Look there. 
There's another self-portrait. I was feeling a little better that day, but I'd gone through bloody hell. I mean, look at my damn sweat coming out from under my damn hair. Hell, I'm bleeding blood. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I had a hard day that day. Man, I spent too many years of my youth locked up, and, and it was wasted, wasteful years. I mean, it should have been some of the best years of my life. And I blew it. I mean, I blew it big time. And I missed out on a lot. My mother told me one time, the truth may hurt, she says, but in the end, she says, it's the best thing to do. And being honest with people, if I am straight, totally honest with people, I have to tell a story that I do not want to tell. It's that ugly. March 12th, 1977, and I got out February 25th of this year. 61 years old now. See, that tells you I went in 20. Yeah. I've been in the blood baths, I've been stabbed, I've been stabbed, you know, two years in the hole, high max time. Been through 15 parole set offs. Awesome. Sitting at the breakfast table eating grits and shit, and you feel something wet fly across you, and you do like that, and it's blood, and you don't even look around because you know you're not meant to see it. You just wipe the blood and keep eating it. And, you know, I've seen it all. I was working 66, 65, 70 hours a week. I just fucked up one night and went to a bar. Had a dude try to put, take my money and I put a knife all over him. I was a walking alcoholic too, so I just said, I lost everything at one time. I just said, fuck it, I don't care. Give me the max sentence that you want me to have. Let's go into court and let's do it and get it over with. You know, and they did. And every fucking thing you can think of, they got on these damn things. You know, TV, movies, radios. Concerts, porn, uh, you hit Google and they t I, I pull my wife's house up on the damn telephone, you know, show her up where she's sitting on out, I'm saying, this is, this is wild for somebody that's been away from you know, the world as long as I have. It's like beam me up Scotty, you know what I mean? It's unbelievable shit. I got to show you this one. My wife's name is Stormy. So I put Stormy on an arm with a storm plow, and he's blow he's going supposedly blowing into her. You know what I mean? So I got shit all over me for my wife, my kids, for people that I honored as dead. Dick dick tattooed, dick pierced, nipples pierced, ears pierced. I'm just an old somebody from the sixties and seventies that uh was thrown out here in the 2019 trying to readjust. I be over half my life in prison, because I did for just about four or five years. I had soap in, in the barber shop. He had uh, affected my voice. He was a nightmare down there. 
white kilo of black, a black kilo of white. That's it. Every, every two or three days, they, they were killing somebody. One day, they closed those on us, the white did, and killed three blacks. It's, they scored the hat, uh, real meek, 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 they cut me with. They had them. One white dude know me pretty good. They thought I, they thought I was Johnny Pundy. He came and said, hey, don't know I'll kill him. That's Johnny Carr. We know him. But it was that out of the dead right now. I was running to get out of town. And I was saying, I was saying, I said, Lord, how much have you been good to me? <laughs> yeah. Them right like there, they got four you see in review. The king said, God, that family will come get them and they bear it. I'm talking about four you can see. My friend got killed. He got killed in C2. He got killed by a piece of internal wire. So, dude come and told me, he said, your, 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 your friend did, your partner did. I said, what about what? Because so, I'm just proud that I made it all the year. I made it through all that. First time in prison, they give me 36 counts of armed robbery. They proved nine of them on me. They give me nine life sentences, and uh, sent me down the road to die. And I, I thought I'd never get out. I was in this one, and I was in the rivers over on the hill. I was in Frank Scott up the road there. I've been to all these prisons down here, 34 years. I always knew stealing was wrong, but because I was hooked on crack, I picked up robbing to support my drug habit. And it got so good that I couldn't quit. It was like a, a high to me. I mean, I enjoyed plotting two or three robberies that day and carrying them out. Hell, and I was. I was robbing two or three places a day. I didn't give a damn. I didn't care. I had big balls. I just didn't have much sense, you know? because they illegally tried me as a recidivist under 17107A, that's why I got life sentence on every, every armed robbery they convicted on. I probably shouldn't have got no more than 920s. I could have maxed out in 20 years. But you'll get to a point where you do so much time in that son of a bitch, and you can only count the bricks and the wall so many times. In your head, you have to, de to deal with the to deal with this, you just have to kind of withdraw within yourself. And you know you're still part of the world around you, but at the same time you feel withdrawn from everything. It's, it's hard to explain. Got a little bit wiser, believe me. The prison will make you wise. Because I've always said I'd rather be out here and not have a damn thing than to be in prison and have a locker full. Because prison's a sad place to be, and it's a bad place to die, too.
There's that spy plane again looking for my reefer and they can't find it. Well, where's the hypo and the ice? Let me get here on it somewhere. Don't do as I do. <laughs> Just do as I say do. I left home when I was 14 because of my dad hit me in the arm with a hammer. Oh, shit. I couldn't trust a dad that I could see. How in the world could I trust a God I couldn't see? I mean, I just, I just, I just walked out on everything that should have meant anything to me. You know, you tell him when he was a kid that he's no good, that he'll never, never amount to anything. I heard those words so many times as a kid coming up. And you plant that seed long enough in a child's mind, he grows up and what does he believe? I'm a failure. All the years after I left home, I went through some hell. I mean, some dangerous spots in my life. Prison in Mississippi, prison in Alabama, and ended up here in Georgia. Before I finally, you know, that's when I had to realize something is wrong. Because I didn't run toward the light, I run from it. But hell, all I was doing is running in fear and smoking and drinking and pouring around, just doing what I could to enjoy what I could on the run. And that was, that was an everyday life for me. It was all about me. It was never about anybody else. I was never concerned. There's a saying that whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, that he is. If you think you're a loser, then hell, you're a loser. Because that's what you're going to think about, losing. No matter how successful you may be at times, which I was. I had good, I had good employment. But I always, you know, I let that negative attitude that I had, that I developed as a young man, I let that play into existence, and it, 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 everything I had fell apart. My legs is giving out from under me. When I first got here, I walked all over this place, all the way around the prison, back through the woods and all that. Yeah, I had three bypasses and I got a tumor on my heart. Be 70 years old and I've stayed in them bars all my life. And they had a lot of fighting, a lot of shooting, a lot of cutting. And we had went back over to the trailer to check on the kids because one of them was big enough to babysit. And I set a case of beer down. I got one out and I sat, sat down there. And first, the screen door opened on the trailer. Arm come in with a pistol. And the first thing I done, I just grabbed it like that by the barrel. And I come out with my knife and he fired it off. And I stuck him in the back. I said, you better turn that gun loose or I'll cut you half in too. It was the man that owned the trailer park. And I, I felt something going down my leg. I looked down there, right there, where that girl was pointing. That's where the bullet come out right there. It went in right there. And I reached down there and picked up a Craftsman half bar and I had the socket in on my end. And I come from the ground up, hit him right there cut his ear in two and bust his butt. He said, I'd killed him. I didn't have no more trouble out of him. He stayed in the hospital unconscious for about three or four days.
we gonna get you next, all right? Yeah, that outfit right there looked pretty on camera. <laughs> Go to be in Hollywood next week. All right. <laughs> Actually, he's trying to find some dudes to take with him. We're going to start a, our own private porn <laughs> you know, business. We got the guys ready, willing to get into it, but we got to find the females. And you know, you got all these local girls wanting free sex. No, no dates, no commitments, just free sex. They like to screw. But at Reedsville, we had five day a week visitation. In most cases, the officers stayed out of there and off the floor. Shit, you could go into the visitation room and you'd see anywhere between one to three to 10, 12 couples deep fucking sucking and eating pussy. And uh, so the women could come there and get what they needed and leave. And they could get petted, pampered, cuddled. If she wanted the dick, she could get that. If she wanted to get it out, she could get that and go home and do her own thing. If your woman come in with your children, you know, everything stopped, you spend a little time with your kids, and then somebody would say, hey, dude, you know, send your little girl, little boy over here, let me and my wife and feed them and entertain them while you and your woman do whatever. Because even those that wouldn't screw in, they might be swallowing drugs or suitcasing drugs at the rectum. And you don't want to really do that in front of your kids. I had a, a friend, called him Love Man. He got his old lady pregnant in the visitation room. Several months later, when she was like her seventh, eighth month, she started going into labor. They just did get her out of the prison downtown to the local hospital to give birth. The kid was almost not just conceived in prison, but almost born in prison. I run across the kid, and I say 98, and he was doing double life. And he was 18 years old. Conceived in prison, gonna die in prison. It took me about two months just to clean this road. I saved my cat sacks. When I first started, I mean, it was pure garbage from that hill all the way to the stop sign. And I'd pick up a little every day. You got so many drunks driving through him. I mean, really? I love everybody. I can get along with a rattlesnake as long as you don't try to bite me. You try to bite me, it's on then. <laughs> That's just the way I am. I work with male inmates in the old Bostick building right behind you. I mean, this is where I retired from. I don't think I would go back to work in the prison system not the way it is today. Cigarette packs. I pick up everything. Everything. They really don't want you defending yourself. And ain't nobody gonna hit me and me not hit them back. I mean, I'm sorry. I come from old school. Like I say, I find everything but money. They don't throw money away. I mean, I've told a lot of inmates. I told one one time right here in this building on dorm five. I told him that he needed his butt beat. And he's, he's like, why you say that? I said, because obviously your parents didn't discipline you. He laughed, he said, yeah, you're right.
I said, see, I told you. You know, got to go back to the Bible. A friend of mine, she had went in her office, and there was an inmate behind the door, masturbating. I said, well, you had him right there. I said, all you had to do was body slam the door because first off, they can't do nothing to you because he's not supposed to be behind that door. But you would get him nailed good if you'd just body slam that door and you didn't know he was back there. You can take a good officer and make a bad officer quick because they have to deal with somebody's bullshit, you know? And not just two or three inmates, you're talking one officer watching 96 inmates. You know, and he has to fucking referee these son of a bitches. You could be having an uh, infected kidney and be hurting like hell with your infected kidney. And uh, their, their attitude is, well, go on over and stand over there. And uh, they, you, they want you to go over and stand against the wall for an hour or something while they bullshitting, just chit-chatting, bullshitting around. And there you are, you can't even damn near stand up. This one guy, I done just had it with this masturbating deal. And I told him, I said, I'll take a butcher knife and cut your, you know what, off and feed it to the damn dogs. He grabs himself and said, ooh, Officer Smith, and takes off and goes the other way. I ain't had no more problems out of him. I tell them real quick, I hate a fucking shit eater. Now, I don't hate an individual officer. You know, I judge an officer by, first by the way they carry themselves and then how they, how they treat me. You know, you treat me with dignity and respect, I treat you back the same way, you know? But if you come in there and you got some kind of problem with you and you done brought it in from home and you think you're gonna take it out on me just because I come up and ask you a fucking question, you know, well, wait a minute, I'm human. And uh, I got feelings too. And you hurt my fucking feelings, I'm gonna snap on your ass and cuss you out, you know? No, there ain't enough money to pay me to go back. But if it hadn't been for me coming to work in for here, I wouldn't be getting two retirement checks. So I get Social Security and a state retirement check at a place I said I'd never work. <laughs> I was 23 years old when I got shot. I knew I was paralyzed when I hit the ground. I couldn't, I couldn't move. And I've been through some pain. I have told actually some of my doctors the stuff they do, man, I would actually rather get shot again. At the nursing home in Blakely, Man, I mean, they mistreated me so bad, I had to end up getting my whole tailbone took out. The doctors was like, who in the world will let a human being get in this kind of condition? And then when you sit in there for so long and you got people just harassing you, saying mean things to you, if I react, and say something, then I'm the problem. So one day, you know, I just see cop cars pulling up, not knowing that the administrator had called them on me and told them that I had actually had some C4 explosives. 
and was threatening to blow up the nursing home. I was trying to call my mom to tell her, you know, to get to the nurse home because, you know, the officers out here harassing me. They won't let me back in the building. One officer grabbed my hand from behind me with extremely force, like, put his knees in my back. And I was telling him that, you know, man, I got bullet fragments. I got a spinal cord injury. And you, you know, but they was trying to, they was talking about tasing me and all that, so. By the time my mom and them did get there, I mean, they didn't pick me up and take me to the police car. They drugged me by my arms. I mean, on like rough gravel, probably even worse than it is. And um, it just scraped my whole tailbone off. could have easily took my life. Just over with some lies or nonsense because I'm trying to stand up for my right. There they come. Hey, Daddy. I thought y'all was dead. The dog just went pulling and the motor's been dead. My entire adult life up to this point has been either incarcerated or on parole. Getting out, doing real good for her about a year and a half. Then things would start to just start unraveling on me. Alcohol, drugs, and the temper. We generally make store runs for people. We take orders and they have to walk this mile or more. Get anything, anything, you know? They don't buy nothing out the machines over there. You cost you $2 for one little old coke, you know? Damn near. That two-year mark just seemed to be the best I could do, and then I would lose everything I had. I, somehow or another, everything, down to my socks and underwear, would be gone when I got out. There would be nothing. I used amphetamines trucking years ago. Prescription. Really good stuff. No bad side effects, no paranoia, no hallucinations. Somebody old enough to remember the pills we were getting, I'd say, sure do wish I had one of them black pills. They'd be like, man, me too, you know. But they don't, uh, they don't exist anymore. They made strict laws on that back in the 80s. Back then it was as simple as going to the doctor and getting you 30 a month. You drove a truck, just go tell him you drove a truck and needed something to stay away. He'd put them on. A drug developed by the Air Force in World War II for long range bomber pilots. Yeah, you could, you could do it with that. <laughs> I set some, I set some records on those things.
Back when I went in the system, like in the early 70s and the early 80s, they were geared towards rehabilitation in the prison system. But in the early 90s, when we got the governor, Zell Miller, in the office, he campaigned on the uh, platform of uh, getting tough on crime and putting the criminals away. He told them, listen, we don't run correctional institutions in the state of Georgia, we run state prisons. So every one of you that's got a correctional sign in front of you, take it down and put state prison on it. And he says, and them inmates that on the back of their shirts where it says Department of Corrections, he said, no, put state prisoner on the back because that's what they are. He said, oh, so take them weights out of the prison system off the yards the public out there, they're saying, here they working their ass off to send their son and daughter to college, and hell, you hear you criminals getting free college. So he said, no, no, no. He basically stripped the whole system of any rehabilitation at all. You know, a lot of guys do belong in prison, and I'm all for that, but these sentences don't fit the crime now. You're putting people away with no hope at all. You told them this is it until you die. So they're already fucked up in the head. They already don't cure because they feel like, what, what, what do I have to cure for? You done told me I'm never getting out, that I'm just a walking dead man. I've seen people stabbed 50, 60 times over a Walkman radio. I have seen men raped or so terrorized or intimidated that they feared so greatly for their life that they submitted to three or four different guys uh, forcing them to commit sodomy and, you know, and raping him and, and all that. And uh, then shortly thereafter, sometimes that individual would kill himself because he couldn't live with himself. I told them, y'all holding me hostage in mental health. I ain't even mental health. And they said, no, nah, Mr. Presley, we recognize mental health. I said, man, y'all crazy as hell. I ain't mental health. I said, I'm just living in that shit. And uh, I did. I lived in that shit for a lot of times, and I've seen a lot of people get depressed. I did. I've seen them hang themselves, go in the shower and hang themselves, or go in the room and hang themselves. I've, I've seen all the cutters that like to cut real bad and shit, try to cut their shit all up. But well, what's bad, you got a lot of mental health people in the prison system that really don't even belong in there. They belong in a mental hospital somewhere. They don't belong in prison, you know? Because most of them are not even capable of underst understanding what they've done, you know? Right now, the prison system is a system that warehouses the mental health. Really, it is. It's all about money like everything else. Anything and everything that we need, we make. And they use us to build prisons too. And to paint them, repair them. We make our own beds, we make our own mattresses. Uh, we make our own clothes, we make our own boots, we make our own stationery. The money they make out the bending machine when people go into visitation because the prices are real, real high. And the money they make off the, uh, the, the prison commissary, uh, they get a cut of that. They said, okay, every money order that comes into this place, we're getting a dollar out of. 
for handling your money. The governor, ex-governor, he had bought into the phone company. So he's making money off that. And, uh, we're trying to, trying to get these prisons open back up where we can put some more people back in it. That's the man that watches the prisons. He might be able to tell you something about them. Well, I don't really know a whole lot because I can't remember nothing because I'm old. You know, I'm wore out, shot out, blowed out, give out, run out, wore out, the whole route. And uh, my doctor said my head done wore out three bodies. <laughs> We're in the right town if you want to be nutty. This is a good place to be nutty. You have a thin lens? Since I retired, I picked up about 30 pounds. I've always been heavy, but nothing like this. I'm embarrassed. Well, Milledgeville, the nut house, you know, uh, 13,000 insane people, and some of them criminally insane, and uh, they wouldn't even let them out in the sunshine. They left them locked, they chopped their family up and stuff like that, you know, with axes and stuff. I mean, there were some crazy, crazy people, fully evil people in the Binion building over there. That was a mental institution, but that was a prison, too. The other ones, they let them come and go. Like I said, when I was a kid, the, the thousands of men were out all in the grove over there and in the power building's front yard, and they waved at everybody. Hey, and I'm a kid. I'm out the window. Hey, I'm waving right back at them, you know. It never dawned on me that they were dangerous in any way. See, this thing was open during the Civil War. It never stopped. And I guess the Union was scared to come out here. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it had its own uh, power plant. I mean, it had sheet metal shop, heat paint shop, plumbing shop, carpenter shop, I mean, you name it. It was totally self-contained city. It generated its own power. 12,000 plus patients, 4,000 employees. I mean, you know, it's, it's an incredible place. Well, uh, three months now I've been riding around in a car, uh, eight hour shifts, and uh, some of them are weird shifts, 11 to seven. And it gets a little, a uh, little haint, might be flying around here, you know. When they renovated the Central State Hospital and turned most of these buildings into prisons, it was done by the prisoners. I mean, they were doing stuff that hadn't been done in years. Me and you couldn't do it, believe me. We'd stand there all day, it never happened to these guys. Most talented people in the world generally are, for some reason, have personal problems. These guys, they're prisoners, you know, or whatever, but uh, they're harmless. They are sweethearts. Of course, when they get out, they're marked. You know, it's sad. It's very, very sad, you know. Come on, that puts more fire to run it. What we think about one another. They wouldn't love at first well, sight. Uh, well, there still ain't no damn love. I mean, golly. Situation. <laughs> I bet. But when we try to get together, he leaves his teeth inside. <laughs> hey, fuck you. <laughs> God damn, I know what he thinks about me now. You shouldn't be talking that's all he cares about. You shouldn't be talking that, David. Don't, that's David, all he cares don't, about. I like that when there's other people around. I'm trying to get you some business. You know, the local women try to get them some. Over the years, I worked about every job in the prison system. Everything, store, administration, medical, all of it. But uh, I just got to a point where, even though I'd done all these things to, to benefit myself and make me a better person and try to set me up for parole, when I came up for parole, that I'd have a, uh, they would say, well, hey, here this inmate is, he didn't do 34 years just laying on his ass, he done all these things to, to better himself, you know, to help rehabilitate him. 
And it got to a point where they didn't care about rehabilitation no more. It's all about punishment now. A man had a tail here way of thinking. Doing the same thing, you're going to get the same action. Even, even if you drink it, you say, when I drink it a little bit, I'm going to go home and lay it out. Hey, hey, Danny, come on, go to Tuzzle. He said, nah, man, I'm going home. It'll never stop you. So that's the way I say it now. I work on the house, and I sell them. By the time I give them enough money to uh, get my own little play, say Jay. I started making back in about 1980. Yep. Yeah. I would make a, a cardboard and, and a roll of paper. I painted with, with coffee and wax. The paint with coffee and wax. Mm hmm. I said them and made it a house. See, I learned this now. The thing you do, come back around. It, it, it might be the, the 20 years, but it come around. You know why I, when I, when I had that stroke, and I died. All the things I did came back to me. Wow. Yeah, I like that thing. I'll dig that. <laughs> that particular, that particular thing I wanted that on there. It's never done me much good to go home. What I've done around there, and there's people that's afraid of me, and they don't let me know that. You get a lot of pats on the backs and come on ins and hey, how you doing? It's good to see you, but they're, they're not. Uh, fear and respect is not the same critter at all. It didn't take much to set me off in the past, and I'm still quick tempered. Uh, yeah, same so, as those. Yeah, yeah, everything's the same. So you got built yeah. screws here. And it's kind of hard for me to keep that on the rails. You know what I mean? I wasn't in the Army that long, uh, but just didn't, just didn't do well when I come home. Uh, just, just didn't do well at all. Uh, I would work. I, I've always worked, but the temper and my solutions uh, were quickly made and and paid for. Got away with some of it, but didn't get away with most of it. But I'm being far more careful with uh, who, what, and where I associate myself and keeps that monster in the cage. Took me far too long to realize I had his key. <laughs> I'll quote Charlie Daniels on that. Watch where you're going and remember where you've been. That's, uh, that's it. If not, you'll just go in a circle. All right. I wasn't looking for no full pardon from society. And everybody say, hey, he's changed. No, I wasn't looking for that. I know that wasn't coming. No, I wasn't going to 
sit back and fool myself and believe in something like that only to face the disappointment of it in later years. But I do believe that there are angels around and about that can come just that quick and rescue us from situations that we're in sometimes. There was a little church I was going to over here and I confided in the pastor of it and told him about my past and my history. And <laughs> I don't go there no more. Oh well, he run my butt off. Well, we got to go through this, we got to do that, we got to get, I said, man alive. I said, what would happen to Mary if Jesus had told her, Mary, you're forgiven, your sins are over and past, go on and be a new person, but you can't be hanging around me because, you know, I don't want to go through the paperwork. <laughs> I don't want to go through the paperwork. And besides, what would other people think if they saw you, an ex-prostitute, hanging around me? Like I say, it's been a wrecker. I've hurt some people in my life and I pray God that the severity of the pain that I have caused them and is still causing them today, from time to time, I hope it never affects them the way it affected me. My dad was a uh, alcoholic. He was kind of like the town drunk. Everybody in that town knew my dad. What was bad though, when he come home drunk, he wanted to beat on my mother. You know, it got so bad that me and our mother and all of us kids had to run into the woods that night to hide from him, keep him from beating my mom any worse. He eventually abandoned us because he went to prison. And uh, when he got out of prison, he didn't even come home. The last time him and my mom saw one another, he talked my mama into sneaking him a gun into the county work camp. Well, before he can escape, somebody in the county jail, some crazy dude saw where my dad hid the gun. And he took the gun and shot himself in the head and killed himself. And there was a big stink behind it, and they found out my, my mother was the one that snuck the gun into my dad. And they got given them both time, and that's how, when I was five years old, we're getting off the school bus, they were arresting my mom. She got eight years, and she done most of it right over here at this Ingram building right up the road there when it was a woman's prison. At first, we went to my grandmother's, and she was so old, she couldn't take care of us six kids, so the court stepped in and took us, put us all in foster care. For a lot of years, we didn't even see one another, my brothers and sisters. 
Sometimes, you know, it might be four or five years before we saw one another, you know? I feel like I've been institutionalized since I was five years old. I feel like I've been raised in somebody's, in somebody's lab or institution, you know, all these years. Lost my father when I was a young man. My mother become a hypochondriac junkie, a drunk. I pretty well have had to fend for myself since I was six, seven years old. You know, still clothes from clothes lines keep me warm in the winter. I had to climb up under a house to get warm because I couldn't get in the house. As I got older, and she took a lover, and you know, they considered herself common law, whatever, married. They was always watching the most perverted biker movies, X-rated movies, where you see women being degraded, beat down, raped, and whatever, and everybody, ha, 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 and it's acceptable. And to where, when I was at home, at times I was even literally chained to my bed. One hand literally chained to the headboard to where it becomes such a way of life if they wasn't around. I would chain my damn self to the bed before I went to bed, you know, because I just thought that was the thing to do. It was always, first stop was a liquor store. Whatever they wanted, they would go in and get, and whatever I pointed at is what I got. By the time I was, say, eight, maybe nine, I could take a pint of Canadian mist or whatever and open and kill it, stay on my feet and not go lay down. You know, I drunk like that over the years, and uh, then I got on the dope. I've done the heroin, the coke, and then you know, the acid, the mushrooms. But when I got on the meth, that was my thing. And I got to the point to where I kept a, uh, a hypodermic in my arm at least 10, 12 times a day, every day, for probably five, maybe five and a half, six years. become a product of your environment. And light follows light. I was at that age of 17 and left foster care and got to running with my brother and some of his friends because of never being accepted and always feeling like I was unloved and raised up knowing that I wasn't like a normal kid. I didn't have a mom and dad. To be friends with them I fell into the things that they were doing, you know? And uh, it changed me. Laugh now and cry later. You know, believe me, I've been through that in my life. The times you feel like laughing and the times you need to cry. If you're a grown man, say you ain't never cried, you ain't been through shit. I tell you, man, life can be hard. Life can be cruel, you know? My dad, he didn't know how to love his children in the right ways. And our family looked like a good, upstanding, middle-class family, and everything was hunky-dory. We never went hungry. We never went without. At Christmas, there was always plenty of gifts under the tree. If you wanted a bicycle and some boots, you got it. If you wanted a bicycle with boots and a BB gun, you got it. But the other side of my dad is a side, of, it's, it's a, really and truly to me, it's a horror story. Some of the physical abuse tarnished my relationship with him, you know, whether it be sexual or physical, and I suffered both sexual abuse and physical abuse. 
sexual part, not just by my dad, but by other men. I didn't know how to enjoy it because I, truthfully, I didn't, I was scared. I was scared to say anything to my dad, scared to say anything to my mother, scared to say anything to my brothers and sisters because I was so afraid that nobody would believe me. And even today, I'm not sure that all my siblings would believe what I tell them. They wouldn't believe that dad would do that. Carry me to the houses of other men and let them sexually abuse me. As a young kid, I don't, I really, I don't know how to deal with it. All I'm trying to do is block things out. I'm trying to build a wall to where I don't have to see what's happened to me. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to look at it. I hated it. And I grew up swearing. I'll always hate anybody that abuses children. <sighs> well, <laughs> it's sad, but I learned to hate myself for it too. Even now, though, I know he loved me in his own way. I hurt because he didn't know how to show it. I hurt for him, not, not myself, but I hurt for him and his childhood. But he took his childhood and brought it into our family. And the way he was treated, he treated his own children. You know, the sins of the fathers passed on from generation to generation. And I found out the hard, horrible way that it's true. Some people care, but people don't really care. My, my, my cell mom, I saw her today. She slept by me in the prison. And she sent me money, you know, called a rowboat. That's why I'm here. She, she called a rowboat day in, day out, you know, trying to get me out of prison. <laughs> Nothing hurt me because I used to do a lot of things to myself. By being in prison, I could avoid. That's why I said I, 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 I wouldn't. I'm here and I would never do it. Do it. Nothing else to get back in prison. You know, a lot of things we do, not that on my test, we do. We, we put ourselves in. Don't buy a prison. We put ourselves in. Anybody that know me or all my friends or whatever, they tell me, they be like, Greg, man, you strong, man. He was like, I couldn't have met if I was in, if I had been through what you'd have been through, I wouldn't have been here, man. I'd have done took myself out. And if you think of how many people just had done committed suicide. But I said that was something I would never do. Never do it. 
You know, people are running in search of something. There's a lot of people in this world that are hurting inside. They, they, something maybe that they've suffered from. I don't care if it's a loss of a loved one, a loss of a brother, a loss of a lover, a loss of a wife, husband, it doesn't matter. And, you know, we never know from day to day what other people are going through. We don't. When a man gets to a point in his life that he knows in his heart that, man, you're, you're, just, you're just so deep against the grain of what's right in society and something that people really frown upon and detest it. You know, I was there with him. I'm ashamed. I really am. I am ashamed of it. You know, people do things and we say, wow, that son of a bitch. I hope they nail him to the fucking wall. And you know, I have often agreed with people. <laughs> that son of a bitch needs to be castrated. People do things and we don't understand why. We don't even want to know why. Because all we look at is maybe the horror of what has happened. Anyway, I can't justify nothing I've ever done that was wrong. I can't justify it. <laughs> Man, why in the hell am I doing this? Man, it just tears me up. For 30 years, 30 years, I have. I guess longed about somebody that would take the time and listen <laughs> to some of what I have been through. And I, you know, I, I'm not blaming other people, I'm not. But you have to look at everything a person's been through that maybe led them to do something that they've done. <sighs> maybe they become the monster that they used to hate. I got to the point in my life that I was tired of being hurt. I was tired of hurting people. I, I sat down and I looked at myself. I says, if I die right now, nobody in this world can say anything positive about David Pittman. And I says, that's ugly. And I says, because even I recognize it. And I thought I was so bad, evil, mean, sorry, whatever, that I was not worthy enough for you to spit on. Because I knew that if you had something that I wanted, I would grab it and take it, whether you wanted me to or not. And you know, I, I said, I got to change it. And reality sometimes is a real motherfucker. I said, and uh, you know, you can get high, you can drink, you can take dope, whatever. I said, but somewhere along the line, you're gonna come back down and the problem's still gonna be there. So 
go ahead and deal with the problem now and accept whatever you got to accept and just take one step at a time and whatever comes up in between then and there, you know, deal with it. I believe that everything from Genesis to Revelations and, you know, thou shalt not kill and all this and, you know, love and help and forgive and forget. But at the same time, I know in my heart, if a man crosses that invisible line, I'll kill him. And to me, it don't go together. So you, you got something contradicting, a battle going on within my mind. And I don't want to do anything that is blaspheming, disrespectful or, or whatever. You can't, you can play games with the world, but you can't play games with God. And uh, you can't play games with yourself if you are trying to deal with the real world. What are you doing, boy? Put that gun on the ground. I used to know your daddy. We worked in the mill together, together, together. I never shall forget the day he passed away, you know. I made him a promise, you know. i look after his son, you know. And then the girl, you know, what are you doing, girl, with your dresses way up high? You know, don't you remember your grandma Nana? She taught us both in Sunday school. You know what, she said, you're such a fool. Life is sacred. Oh, this life is sacred, sacred. You know, this, I was having my guitar, you know. You want to know the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. The only answer is not that we turn back to God. Well, that would be great. It'd be great if the United States would just turn back to God. If the church would turn back to God, if the church, it's all our fault. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways, humble themselves and pray, I will heal their land. But the church ain't just too busy building, building big buildings and getting huge uh, money. I don't know the answer. The answer, of course, is for us to keep praying and keep believing. You can forgive, but you don't have to forget. Because you have to forgive for God to forgive, give you. I forgive them, but I don't trust them, and I won't forget them. If, if I give my opinion on what this state or any other state should do concerning prisons, real quickly, I'd say they'd build some more of them, some big ones, big ones. The bulk of the people there don't need to ever get out, and there's a whole bunch of them out here that needs to go in. That's just the way I see it nowadays. Lots of bad people nowadays. Lots of bad people. If it was left up to me, any sex offenders, and I know for sure, I'd kill every one of them. I'd just walk down there shooting. Because I ain't got no use for a sex offender. That's just not right. I can't, I, I, I can't live with that.
I've never been open with anyone about this, never, except for you. I've always guarded myself about talking about something like this because people might think, why did you do the things that you did? I have no answer for that. Call it selfishness, call it stupidity. Some people think, how, how in the world can you stand and look at a camera and say these things? How can he expect people to ever forgive him? And the truth is, I don't expect him to. I really don't. Because if I were in their shoes, I would find it hard to do so on myself. I would really find it hard to do so. in order to love somebody else. And, uh, and once you love yourself, then you can love others, you know, because uh, we, we all have feelings. You know, we, got, we all have feelings. I could stay the rest of my life now. So, in a way, I'm blessed. I, that's my, I live on that. My mind, I'm blessed because I, I'm living. I could have been dead. So, I feel I'm blessed. <laughs> stuff going on in the world, on the news, and it's depressing, man. You know, you got people now with bars at their house that don't, don't want to come out the house because of how it is. I'm even scared to watch the news, tell you the truth, because when you see cops killing innocent people, man, I mean, even the kids, I mean, I, I'd rather listen to music keep a positive attitude. I tell you, it really feels strange to me today when I walk into a convenience store or a liquor store or whatever, and I hand them money, you know? Because <laughs> used to, they was handing me money, you know? I'm not trying to rob nobody. You know, I got too much to lose. I'm just trying to enjoy my life and do what I can to rebuild it and pick the pieces up, you know, and go on. I can do all that with a positive attitude, too. Y'all know I'm gone Monday. They let me go home. Going all the way home to the old lady. I really don't expect people to love me. But if they do, man, it just fills my heart with the joy I've, I've needed all my life, the happiness. Love is real. Love cares. Love is when you say, okay, I love you for who you are today. You're trying to make changes, and I'm gonna love you enough 
to make you want to change even more than what you've already changed. To me, that is love. And when you recognize that love, it teaches you a little bit about how to love others. And next to that, the most important thing is that you have forgiven yourself 